Praise God. Hallelujah. I, I, I thank the Lord. I, I love the word of God. I love the Lord. It's, I was telling Sister Laura Lee, it's been a battle this week. It really has. It feels like the devil's attacking a lot of wonderful people. And if you're doing something for God, he's going to target you. I tell you that. If you're living your life for the Lord, if you're just living righteously, living holy before God, trying to live a spotless, sinless life, uh, and don't get the idea that I believe in sinless perfection. I don't. I'm just saying that you're doing your best to live a life unto God. I know that you're going to be attacked of the devil. Now, we're going to go to Psalm 68 here today. A message, really, it's, it's not originated from me. A message I read. I've had it for many, many years. And uh, it's such a good word. I thought, man, that, that, that needs to preach. And so I, I've taken parts of this, and I've made it my own. I've just, God, as he has shown me, as he's revealed to me, and I pray that it will be a, a message and it will minister to your heart. Um, in Psalm 68, uh, and look at verse uh, 7, look at verse 7, and look at verse 8. Praise God. Amen. Almost in the middle of your Bible, a little bit to the left there. Praise God. In the Old Testament, Psalm 68 and verse 7, and it says, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, say law, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the what? The presence of God, even Sinai itself, was moved. Now listen to this. Sinai, the mountain was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Now look at verse 8 again. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped, at the presence of God. That is catastrophic, wouldn't you say? And then it said even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. I'd like to minister on the thought of the subject here today, the awful presence of God, the awful presence of God. I pray that the Lord would minister to our hearts. I pray that our, 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 our hearts would be open, attentive to the word of the Lord that would speak to us. God, help us. Let's pray, Father, as we come to you in the name of the Lord. We give you all praise and glory. As I stand behind this sacred desk, I pray for the unction. I pray for the anointing. I need your spirit. I want the Holy Ghost. I want the presence of the Lord in our hearts and our lives. I want God you to pour out of heaven and to do something wonderful to your church today. In the day of darkness, in the day of which we're living in today, when many people seem to have lost hope, God, I pray that you would visit your people once again. Before the rapture of the church, before the coming of the Lord, I pray that our hearts would be attentive and awakened and aware of the very presence of God, Father. Thank you, Father. We love and praise you as we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. You may be seated and, and God bless you wonderful folks. You know, I want to talk about the awful presence of God today and what's missing in the church today is the awareness of the awful, awful presence of God. I want to say that again. What's missing today, and I believe it's, it's, it's getting worse. There's a trend the past 30, 40 years is the awful presence of God. The fear of the Lord, Bible said, is the beginning of, of wisdom. And through the years, the church is guilty of reducing God down to a human level. Now, I've heard people call God, they, they refer to him as their daddy. Well, I, I understand what they're trying to say because they're getting that from the scripture out of Romans that says that he's Abba Father, but that's not what that means. It, it's just that there, the scripture re refers to a relationship with God that we have through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. But I want to say this, that God, he's not your daddy. He is Lord God Almighty. We have to understand. we got to come back to this. Uh, I've heard people call him a good buddy. No, I'm sorry. He's not a good buddy and it grieves my spirit and my heart when I hear people like that or they say he's the man upstairs and I just about die when I hear people say that no my friend he's not just the man upstairs he's not just a good buddy Bible said that he's king of kings and he's lord of lords Bible says it's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess I've heard preaching that put him on a human level as if he's the same as you and me and by doing this we've lost the fear of God church let's get honest with ourselves we've lost the reverence of God today people no longer fear God. The church no longer fears God. I, I, I Listen, I, I, I know we might have our different opinions, and I know that God doesn't judge by the outer appearance, and I realize that God looks at the heart, but there's been a trend lately, and I, I'm grieved by this. Uh, there are preachers now that stand behind the holy, sacred desk of God, preachers that are spiritual leaders now, and I see them dressing in a sloppy dress. I see them dressing in a casual dress, and I want to say this. Uh, I realize that God looks at the heart, and I know that. I'm not trying to judge this, but I'm just going to say there's a 
message in that today. And what I'm seeing now is there's a message now that says that we lack reverence unto God. There's a, there's a message today that says we lack respect unto God. So what happens is we have a casual dress in other sense uh, because we serve a casual God and it's a casual message. Uh, it's a casual gospel and it's a casual uh, Christianity today. And, and he's no longer ho uh, holy to them is what I'm finding. The holiness of God. Uh, I have a sister Faith, uh, uh, your, your grandson Logan uh, Justice uh, did a wonderful job preaching last Sunday down at the church he's in, and I believe it's in Daphne, Alabama, uh, over in that area. My Lord, and I and I text uh, uh, brother uh, Tom, and I text him the other, uh, yesterday, and I just said, I, your son does a wonderful job. He blesses me, such a young man. He's in his I don't know early thirties, uh, and uh, just has such a knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Bible and knowledge of the Word of God. And uh, I said, but I just appreciate the fact that he dressed up so nicely to be able to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. See that says something to me because you'll never worship a God that you can manipulate. I wish somebody would hear me today. You'll never worship a God you can control. Uh, my friend, we've lost the days of Ananias and Sapphira, and yet I do believe that God is the same today as he was back in the New Testament. Uh, I don't believe that God uh, has changed. Uh, people have changed. The church has changed. The direction of the church has changed, uh, but the Bible says that God doesn't change. Uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, listen, the awful, the awful presence of God is what we're missing today. The the word awful in the Hebrew means dreadful. It means fearsome. And the word awful in the Hebrew means great or it means awesome. We sing the song, you're awesome in this place, mighty God. See, we normally give a negative connotation to this word, but that is not at all the biblical meaning. You see, uh, in the Old Testament, Jacob was touched by the holy dread of God. During the journey to Haran, you remember the story in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, he lay down and he slept. And while he was sleeping, he had a dream. He had a vision given him by God. And in the dream, he saw a ladder reaching into heaven and the angels were ascending and descending upon the ladder there and it was there that the Lord revealed himself to Jacob declaring I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac and God was reaffirming his covenant with Jacob that he had given to Abraham and God said this to him I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will never leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you and so God is faithful and God is a God of his word and the promises of God are yes and amen and God keeps his promises and God can be trusted and it was after this that Jacob woke up out of his sleep and said surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Listen to this. The next verse says and he was afraid and said how dreadful is this place. Another translation says how awesome is this place. See Jacob realized that he was in the presence of God and a holy fear came upon him. A dreadfulness came upon him. Jacob had a holy reverence for the awesomeness of God's presence. There was a reverence. Daniel was another one who was touched by the great dread of God's presence in Daniel chapter 9 verse 4 and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said oh Lord the great listen to this dreadful awesome God and Daniel prayed and as he prayed he was struck with a holy reverence of the awesomeness of God's presence in prayer maybe you know what I'm talking about maybe you have been as you've sought God as you faced God as you've, as you've gone into that prayer closet and sought the face of the Lord then all of a sudden the holy presence presence of God came upon you in a way that maybe you've never encountered in your life before and all you could do is bow before him or kneel before him and worship him as God's presence has come. God also said to all of Israel sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Isaiah is saying let God grip your heart with a holy dread. In other words the Lord God Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And you may believe that this kind of fear or terror describes an Old Testament concept of God and that Jesus came to reveal to us the Father that he's full of love. Yes, I agree with you all together. I know I agree that God is love. God describes what love is. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible said that God demonstrates, God shows us his love toward us and while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us or Christ died for the ungodly. That is love. I agree 
with you all together that God is merciful and God is full of kindness and patience. God is long suffering and he is full of goodness. He is a perfect and loving heavenly father. I agree with you 100% but also he is a spirit that's high and holy. You see Isaiah in chapter 6 of Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and when Isaiah saw the holiness of God and the glory of God he saw his sin. He saw his undoneness and the reason we're not seeing our sin in the church and the reason the church has lost the fear of God and the reason we've gotten away from things is because we've lost the holy dread of God and we no longer see our sin. Oh, come on, church. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We've lost the spirit of conviction in the church. I said we've lost the spirit of conviction. Oh, that's just Pastor Malden. That's just Pastor Mark. I, I, I appreciate my kids. I, I do. Of course, everybody appreciates their kids. They love their children. I appreciate my children. I do. And I appreciate the, uh, my, my girl, of course, is over in Thailand, Bangkok as a missionary. Pray for her. Lift her up before the Lord. Would you do that? It's not easy being alone over there, but I appreciate my boys and their wives that come here. And I, I appreciate that. I know I'm, I'm dad. I realize that, aren't I? I'm dad. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm papa-in-law, right? I'm father-in-law. I'm, I'm dad-in-law, whatever it might be. But, 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 but I appreciate the fact that they that even though they know I'm human and even though they know that I'm their dad, they also know that I'm pastor here at this church, but they listen to the word of God. They listen to the word of the Lord because they know that God has something to say. God is going to speak through his word. Amen. So you got to look past just the human body here and realize what is God trying to say? And you got to weigh that against the word of God as you study the word of God, as you read the word of God, you can, you take the message and you look at the word of God and compare it and see what you think. But God's going to speak. I believe every time we gather together, open the Bible, God is going to say something to one of us. Amen. Praise God or all of us. But I know that God, you may, I, I realize God is perfect, but also he's high and holy. The problem is we've become too familiar with God. What did you say, pastor? I said, the problem is we've become too familiar with God. See, we've made him to be like unto ourselves. That's why we don't recognize his holiness. The Bible says that he's an all-consuming fire, a holy and dreadful, powerful Savior. That's who he is. Maybe if we get back to preaching who Jesus is, instead of trying to make him to be something else than what he is, preach the Jesus in the Bible, preach the holy God of the Bible. Maybe there'd be a holy reverence and fear and dread that would come upon the church again, and may there be a holy conviction that would smote our hearts and deal with us according to the will of God and ever the way of God that wants to deal with us. You know, John, John, the apostle uh, who is known as the apostle of love, saw the Lord coming to the churches and all his New Testament glory. We see that in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. Jesus talking to the churches in chapter 2 and 3 in Revelation. But in chapter 1 of uh, Revelation, uh, John described him this way. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And after John saw him, he fell at his feet as a dead man. Listen, my beloved, if Christians today beheld but a fraction of God's holiness, if we beheld but a fraction of his dread, nobody would be able to stand in the church services of today. We would bow before God in holy reverence. Oh, we would be like the priests that fell prostrate when the glory of God came after they dedicated the temple unto God and the, the very Shekinah glory of God came. Hallelujah. And they fell on their faces and they worshiped God in his holiness. Oh, my friend, we would acknowledge the holy presence of God and there would be an awareness in the church. There would be a reverence or a dread that would grip our hearts. But my friend, let me ask you here today, why? Why are we not seeing this today? What has happened to the Pentecostal church even? Yeah, that's right, the Pentecostal church. Most of people today come to church. That I'll be honest with you, we come preoccupied, don't we, church? Many times we do. I mean, it takes us a while before we can start thinking spiritually because we come preoccupied. It's as if we don't recognize his presence in our minds or in other things. Our minds are on other places. And our minds have become consumed with our problems and our situations. And I'm not preaching that to you. I'm preaching 
preaching with you because I do the same thing. And I try to focus on the Lord and focus on the word of God and the presence of the Lord. But we have become immune to his holiness. I said we become immune to his holiness and we treat God like he's a good friend or a buddy. We've forgotten that he's Lord God Almighty. We've forgotten that he's the all-consuming fire. We've lost the fear of God. We've lost the holy grip of God today in the church. I said we've lost the holy grip of God in the church. There were times oh, back in 1800s, 1700s in the United Puritans and so forth and um, they were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and there were people that would be in the, uh, I believe it was Jonathan Edwards that was preaching the word of God and uh, people there in the church, you know, they, a lot of people there and they were just kind of, you know, carelessness in the church and they were really paying attention and he got up and he began to preach and declare the word of God and there were a lot of sinners there that had come in that service and he began to declare the word of God and all of a sudden about in the middle of that sermon all of a sudden a holy fear a holy reverence a holy grip came upon the congregation and the Bible said that they grabbed onto their pews and they grabbed onto their the post and columns they had in the church like this and they were begging him to stop preaching because of the power and the fire of almighty God that came into that service and people were saved I'm just saying we treat God like he's nonchalant we treat his, we treat his message like it's nonchalant but you understand that God is holy that God is almighty that God is powerful and we need the holy dread of God and the convicting power of the Holy Ghost to come back in the church that we might see Jesus for who he is glory to God like John the Revelator saw him Oh, my beloved friends, now I would love to see our hearts that yearn for the glory of God. I, I believe that's something that's missing today. I mean, our prayer should be, Lord, let us see your glory. Pour out your presence among us. Let your glory be such that sinners are convicted of their sins and Christians of their sloth. In other words, God, revive us and renew us and awaken us. Moses wanted to see the glory of God, and Moses cried out to the Lord, show me your glory, and God allowed him to see the backside of God, the backside of God or his glory, Hallelujah. Oh, God, show me. I want to see the Lord. I'm not come to church to be religious. I'm not come to church to put in my little hour, hour and a half, two hours of a religious routine. I have a relationship with God. I want to know him. I want to know the Lord. I want to be in his glory. I want to have an encounter with God that changes me forever and eternity. I don't want to be the same, but I want to be more like Christ. I want to be more like him. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, the question is, will we pay the price for such a manifestation of the glory of God? No, no, come on now. Even in Pentecostal circles, here we are. We don't put much effort into it anymore. We want the pastor to do all the praying. We want the pastor to do all the work. And we don't put much effort into it. Why? I mean, will we separate ourselves under prayer? Will we find that prayer closet? Will we fast anymore? I think fasting is a passing thing and a fading thing in the church today. But you know what? Fasting is effective. And we need to get back to fasting and praying and seeking God. Because we say that we want the glory of God. But not many are willing to do what it takes to see the glory of God. Because we don't want to suffer. We got, in our generation today, we, everything, we want everything given to us. In this younger generation, they don't don't want to work anymore. Everything given to them. We've created lazy people. That's what we've done. We've created a lazy generation that wants everything given to them, pay for the school, pay for everything, do everything for them, and then they don't want to get a job or they good at a job. They don't want to do it anymore. That's what we've done in America, but that kind of spirit, that kind of thinking has filtered itself into the Pentecostal church today. I'm not talking about other churches. I know how they are. Some of them. I'm talking about the Pentecostal church has come into the church now. It's come in that, that thinking, and we don't want to put any effort into it. We want everybody else to do it. Just give me, give me, give me. I want the blessings of God without prayer. I want the blessings of God without fasting. I want the blessings of God without it costing me anything. Well, folks, listen to me. You're not going to get anything from God unless you go to the Lord, unless you cry out to God, unless you pray, unless you fast, unless you seek. The Bible talks about how we're to seek the Lord. If you'll knock on heaven, if you'll believe God, if you'll be persistent, I know in time that God will pour out his presence, his glory, his power, his blessing upon you if you believe by faith but don't just sit there thinking you're going to get something from God you've got to put something in it hallelujah amen. Amen. amen all right can I keep on preaching is that okay all right 
All right. Hallelujah. Now listen, understand, God has an appointed time for every moment, every awakening, every restore, restoration, every outpouring. When that designated time comes, God awakens and stirs as if from our sleep. And I think that's what happened today. I think we're asleep and don't know it. Have you ever been in your car driving down the road and you fell asleep in the car and all of a sudden you woke up? You didn't know you fell asleep until you woke up. And when you woke up, you're like, oh man, I'm really awake, right? You're slapping your face and you're trying to pop mints in your mouth. You're trying to drink, drink water or something to keep you awake, right? Your eyes are like bug eyes. You're like this big because you fell asleep and you didn't know it. That's happened to me before. Thank God for those rivets they have on the side of the road here on Highway 23 because one day I was coming down and I fell asleep and I drifted off and I didn't know I fell asleep. I didn't know that I was drifting off and my car hit those rivets or whatever those things are and it woke me up and when I woke up, I was awake. And it's almost like that. The church is going down the road driving, sleeping and it doesn't know it. But we need God to wake us up. Glory to God. We need the Lord. Amen. What that? Amen. Praise God. Listen, when that designated time comes, God awakens and stirs us as from our sleep. The stirring always occurs in man's darkest hour when everything seems hopeless, when everything seems lost. A time when only a sovereign work of God can save the day. No such event takes place without full preparation. Everything in its place when God speaks the word, when God says that it's time and God always prepares vessels just prior to his outpouring. He shuts men up, men and women up in his presence and he places them in strategic places. See, God has placed us here, I believe, for such a time as this. Let me tell you something. It's not easy. It definitely doesn't come without its challenges. It's not convenient. It's not fashionable. But God has established us for such a time with a message to declare to a lost world that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he saves. That he delivers. That he sets the captive free. That he baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And the great message that Jesus Christ is coming back for the redeemed. He's coming back for the church. Amen. He's not coming back for the lost. He's coming back for the saved. Hallelujah. I realize that God's raising, I believe, pastors, ministers, uh, blesses me, Sister Faith's grandson, blesses me, people that are broken and have a heart for God. There are those who have a cry for God, and they want revival. They want to experience his glory. I know there are some of you today in this congregation that want the glory of God. You want revival. You want the presence of God. And when the set time came for God to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage, he already had a man in place in the wilderness that was trained and ready. God had a Moses. God had a, had a, had a, had a, had a priesthood, if you will. He had an Aaron, and he had a people who had come to the end of themselves who were ready to hear a message of deliverance. Israel, they were in bondage. They were ready to get out of their captivity. They were in the middle of a fiery furnace facing the darkest hour, and their deliverance couldn't come 15 years prior to that. It couldn't come 20 years or any time before that because God had a set time, and he had said that they'd remain in their captivity for 430 years and he watched over that time to the very day but after that 430 years came nothing can stop his plan from going into motion I said nothing can stop it in that time God had put everything in place tending to every detail and he, when he called Moses he was able to put all his fears to rest because God told Moses go return to Egypt for all the men who sought your life are dead Exodus 4 and 19 praise God see God had killed off every man who remembered Moses you see, he had prepared the way. God was working behind the scenes all along the way. All that time in the wilderness, all that time in the desert, you think God isn't doing anything, but all the time God is working, God is preparing, and God is making things happen behind the scenes that you don't realize. Listen, in the will and in the plan of God, nothing can stop him. I want you to get this. In the will of God and in the plan of God, nothing can stop him. Nothing. We have no fear in the will of God. As long as you know you're in the will of God, there is no fear. I remember the first time my daughter and I went over to the, uh, well, not Philippines. I've been there too. But over to, uh, uh, where was I at? Uh, uh, Thailand. We were over in Thailand. We were in the jungle. Hey, Amen. We had to take one of those long boats, John boats, long boats, where those things are. And we had to go up the river. And I mean, I mean, we're, we're, we're in nowhere land. I mean, we're in the jungle. I mean, if something happens, there's no hospital. I mean, we're out there in the boondocks, in the jungle. I mean, away from civilization, away from everything. Now, I remember my daughter and I, and I remember we, we, we were hiking in a certain area, getting to a certain village. But we'd come to this area, kind of cleared out on a hill. And I was talking to my daughter, and I said, I have 
never felt more safe than we are right now. There was a war going on. There's still a war going on. So we had people with M16s and things like that that were guarding us, but there was no one around us that time. They, anybody can shoot or snap, uh, take us out, uh, whatever kind of thing. But I'm just telling you, I told my daughter, I've never felt more safe than I am right now. Why? Because there's no fear in the will of God. You know that you know that you're in his will. The devil can't stop God. Demons can't stop him. All the armies of the world can't stop him. Who can't stop him? The World Health Organization, NATO can't stop him. God's will and plan will come to pass whether you believe it or not. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. It's for an appointed time is what I'm saying. And in the same way, when God sets time, came to deliver Israel from Babylon, he had everything ready. Everything was in place. And he had, he had said that Israel's captivity would, it would end after how many years? Remember that? In Babylon, how many years? 70 years. That's right, church. It would end after 70 years. Get this. And in the 70th year, the 70th year, the last year, Daniel felt a stirring. He felt an urgency in his heart. He shut himself up with God. He travailed in prayer. And that's when he read the book of Jeremiah. He read the Bible, the Old Testament. Testament, just like we read the Bible. Daniel counted that the number of years since the prophecy had been given by Jeremiah was 70 years. In other words, it's time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's shouting time. It's praising time. And Daniel said this, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. He's reading the book of Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. God had a set time when the captivity was be, to be released. And Daniel said, now, hallelujah, it's the time. God is about to do something wonderful. My Lord, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'd be shouting. If I knew after 70 years, it's 70 years, hallelujah. This is the day of Jubilee. This is the day of the release of our captivity. This is the time that God, uh, God's going to move. All this time we've been waiting. All this time we've been trusting. All this time we've been praying. We've been going to church. We've been faithful unto the Lord. We've been doing everything we know to do. And we wonder when God win. Dan, hallelujah. Daniel got a hold of Jeremiah's book. And he read and he said, now is the time. It's high time. God is about to move. And God's about to deliver. Praise God. Hallelujah. Ezra the scribe was filled with a new revelation of God's uh, desires and because God was preparing him to bring forth a, a people a holy word to teach and the minister and as Ezra read the Bible he read the word of God tears began to uh, go down the cheeks and they began to weep before the Lord just reading the Bible they began to weep Nehemiah was placed in the king's court as a preparation for God's building rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem you know the story that was no accident God strategically placed Nehemiah where he needed to be for the right time God knows what he's doing and the people had a mind to work and they completed the wall in just 52 days. Nehemiah was greatly used by God. But I'm trying to tell you here that he was more than just a cupbearer for the king. God had a call on his life. Listen to me, my beloved. You are more than whatever your occupation is. Wherever God has placed you, whatever you're doing, you are more than that. You have a call of God. You have the touch of God. The Bible said you're the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones to be holy and separate unto the Lord. You have an anointing, the Bible says you are more than just your occupation you're a child of the king you're an ambassador of the lord of glory and you're a light and salt god has light and salt sprinkled out all over this darkened world he has his people strategically placed at the right place at the right time for the will of god for the purpose of god amen somebody shout somebody shout hallelujah all right i'm halfway done to help me, okay? Amen. All right. <laughs> Haggai and Zerubbabel were both stirred for the work of the Lord. Haggai, we can, we can read it there. And uh, let me see if I can read it real quick. Haggai chapter 1. Look at verse 13. I don't have it on the monitor. But Haggai chapter 1, verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Listen to this, verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, 
the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. God began to move. See, that's what we need, the spirit of the Lord. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, God, uh, the Lord of hosts, their God. They did the work of God. They did what the call of God was upon their life. See, what I'm saying today is we need to pray. We don't need to be passive. We see there's a passive spirit in the church today. We don't be, need to be lukewarm or lackadaisical, but we need God. We need to pray that he would begin to move upon his people with his spirit once again, like he did with Haggai and Zerubbabel to do the work of God. And God used them to stir the hearts of the people to arise and to continue the work of the Lord. It takes one in the church that has the fire, one in the church that has the fullness of the Holy Ghost that'll get up and begin to praise and to worship God. And that fire will begin to spread and to catch on to others. And they'll begin to get the fire. They'll get the spirit of God. They'll begin to worship. They'll begin to praise. They'll begin to serve God. Hallelujah. No longer asleep, but awakened. Just takes one. Don't be discouraged by the enemy. Don't allow yourself to grow complacent, but arise and finish the work, church. Arise. Continue the work while you can. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. We have to work right now. Work for the kingdom of God. Work for the Lord. Let's, let's work while we can. Because I do believe that any time, any moment, and I'm ready and expecting the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, all signs and things have set up. You can see it, and you know it, and you can sense it in your spirit yeah. hallelujah yeah. and if we can sense the coming of the Lord at any time it ought to cause you and I to be more diligent to be faithful unto the Lord yeah. I'll be honest with you some people are in habits every other Sunday they come every other Sunday every other Sunday I see habits but when you have the fire you just want him. You want him. You want God. You want the Lord. The prophet Haggai had warned when God's time came, but some would not believe, just like we have today. Listen, they said the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built to do the work of the Lord, to build the house of the Lord. But when God said time comes, nothing can stop it and nothing can hinder it. It's like a mighty Niagara overflowing, sweeping every airway, everything before it. But listen, when all looks lost, when it looks as though Satan will prevail, that's when God's set time comes in. Glory to God. If there's ever a time we are living... I know, oh, pastor, things are hard. Things are difficult. We are living in a glorious time. In this darkened world, there's never been more of an opportunity for the light of the church to shine. Not religious, not stuffed shirts, pharisaical religion. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about something of heaven. I'm talking about the glory of the Lord. I'm talking about something supernatural, something spiritual that comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's when God's church and society, that only, uh, that only he can do what's needed because it'll take a miracle. Some of us need a miracle. Some of us need God to step in our lives. Some of us need a touch from heaven. Some of us need for God to move in our situation and our circumstances. Trust him. Believe him. Call upon him. Don't give up. Jesus said that when we see everything spinning out of control and men's hearts are failing them for fear, we should look up. It's time to look up. Why? Because our redemption draweth nigh, the Bible said. Look at there. I'm going to read the scripture here in, in Luke 21 and 25. Luke 21 and 25. And there shall be signs, Jesus said, in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon uh, the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. I think we're living in that time. Men's hearts failing them for the fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, here they come, church. Then it says, look up. I said it says, look up. It's time for the church to look up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We need to look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I say this, our salvation is nearer today than it was yesterday. He's coming. I'm, I'm looking for the Lord. Make sure your election is sure and right before the Lord that you're saved and you know that you are, but it's time for the church to look up and look unto God. Look up for your redemption is near. Jesus is coming. When everything down here is falling apart, God has got it. He's in control. The world is a mess, but our heavenly world is intact. Man is a mess. Man is sinful. Sin has tainted and destroyed the human race. But Jesus gave his life to redeem us out of this darkness, out of this dark pit, and to place us in the light of God's Son. Hallelujah. And I'm saying.
saying it's a mess down here. I know inflation's high. I know retirement's cut in half. I know the stocks are down. I know gas prices are higher than they've ever been in recorded history. But this is my world. My world is heaven. My world is God. My world is the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I'm telling you, they can double the prices that somehow God will provide. I said somehow God will provide. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> World, you can do what you want. I'm connected to heaven. I'm connected to God. Amen. <laughs> it's a mess. I mean, get your head out of the ditch, out of the sand. My wife says, I always say things wrong. I can never get it right. Whatever it is, get it out of the sand. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't fret over it. This isn't your world. Don't fret over it. It's not your world. Well, huh? It's not right what they're doing. Listen to me. You're not taking one red cent with you to heaven. That's all this world wants is your money. They can care less about your health. They can care less about who you are. You're just a number and a dollar to them. That's all you are. Amen. And when you can't give them the money they want, they'll leave you alone. You know what I'm talking about? Whatever it is. That's all they want. That's the world. For, for, for the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Nothing wrong with having money because you got to have it to live. I understand that. I'm just saying, don't get so bent out of shape with what's going on down here. Be connected with what's going on. Listen to me. Listen to me. If, okay, hold on. If God can provide for Elijah at the brook Cherith, there's your water. If he can bring a, a meat and bread in the morning by the ravens and meat and bread in the afternoon or the evening by the ravens, don't you know that God can take care of you. Hey Amen. God takes care of the sparrow. That little itty bitty bird. God takes care of the sparrow. God knows the number of hair on your head. He knows the colors of those hairs. He knows your thought. He knows everything. God's in control. He owns a cattle on a thousand hill. Forget the world. The world's going the wrong direction. What you got to do is try to snatch and save those in this world that they might be heaven bound. Snatch them out of the hands of Satan. But don't get bent out of shape of this world. Don't get too caught up in what's going on down here. Just get caught up in what's going on up there. God, have the faith to believe God. Have the faith to believe the Lord. Oh, listen to me. God sent Elijah to a widow woman that's about to eat her last meal. He said, if you'll give me that cake first, God will take care of you. And that's what she did. And they never ran out of meal. They never ran out of supply. What does that tell us? And all the things in this world, in this life, you got to put God first. Put him first. Put him first. Don't just say God's first. Live God first. Live like God's first. I mean, how are you going to get anywhere with God if you can't even learn how to tithe? The simplest thing. Simple. Man, God's only asking for 10%. The government asked for 28. <laughs> All right. <laughs> If you're still here, it's on you. <laughs> if you're going to listen to the rest of this, it's on you, okay? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Now, you might not agree with everything. That's all right. I still love you. You love me. It's all right. You got your own opinion. I realize that. But, but there are certain things in this book that uh, are not, uh, you can't argue over. You know this truth. Amen. You know it's right, okay? Hallelujah. All right. Let me, where was I at now? <laughs> All right, now, 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 listen. God, it, it, this is set time uh, to awaken the remnant in the modern Babylon of today that we're living in. To raise up a final testimony to this doomed world. God has been setting everything in place. He has prepared a people to begin to pray and intercede for His interest. God has been setting all things in place to pour out His Spirit. A battle is raging in the heavenlies. Satan knows His hour is late. He knows that His time is running out. So once the Lord has decided He's going to move, how do we know when the set time for God's deliverance comes? Well, there are a few things that occur here. Number one, and I'm only going to get to this point here today. Number one, I got to hurry. When God set time arrives, he builds a holy fire. When, when, it, when it was time for to deliver Israel from a bondage to Egypt, God had to get the attention of those who were called to lead the people out of darkness. He did this by building a fire. In other words, he started a burning. God started a fire. He started a burning. Moses was alone on the mountain of God. Suddenly in sovereignty, a fire was set before him. A flame was sent to arrest a man of God. And it was a type of the Holy Spirit, a fire that never goes out. John the Baptist said he'll baptize 
baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. On the day of Pentecost, divided tongues of the fire sat upon each of them, and they were full with, filled with God and full of the Holy Ghost and full with boldness. And, and they went out and preached the gospel of Christ, and thousands were saved and came into the church. Uh, God sent fire to consume the fire. The, in the tabernacle, the lamps were filled with oil, and they burned with fire. The fire that God started a bush that burned but wasn't depleted was a fire that was put in Moses' heart, put in his bosom. And from that point on, his heart would be ablaze and God's, uh, with God's message. He was captivated by God's holy presence. He was set apart to be a vessel of deliverance for his generation. But let me ask you, my beloved friends here today, is there a stirring in your heart anymore? Maybe you've been saved a long time. Maybe you've been saved for a little while. But I'm going to ask a question. Is there a, any kind of fire from God that's blazing in you? Do you feel a fire burning in your innermost being? See, God wants your attention. God wants to put a fire in your heart and my heart and the heart of all of his church, regardless of what denomination is. We need the fire. We need to get back to God. We need a bush that burns in our heart again. Listen, God does this. He wants your attention, not because you're good, not because you deserve it, but because he needs a people whom through his spirit can flow and work. He needs a people who heart, whose hearts are pure and prepared for his presence, as God told Joshua. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And the church, if the church comes back to God, if the church will quit touching the unclean thing, because that's what's happening today. We're touching the unclean thing. We're watching the unclean thing. We're doing the unclean thing. If the church would come back to holiness and separation unto God, if the church would once again prepare her heart to come into the holy presence of God, God will do wonders. The Bible says this. God will move upon his people and God will touch the oppressed, deliver the bound, save the lost, heal the sick, raise the dead. God will do wonders among you. We just have to have a revival of God. We just might have a revival that will last longer than just from one Sunday to the next. God will manifest his glory among his people that have prepared their hearts for such a time as this. Bible says that when Moses saw the fire, he turned aside. Moses could have walked on. He could have ignored it. He could have said, I have too many things to do. I'm busy. That's the church today. I'm too busy. We, we, the attitude we have is I can take it or leave it. That, that's the wrong kind of attitude. He put us, listen, Moses, he... He put aside all his own interest in Exodus 3 and 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, after he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. When God saw Moses turned aside, <laughs> does God see you turn aside? God has been doing the same thing for centuries, but most Christians never turn aside. Listen to me, my beloved. And I say it in love. God starts a fire in their heart, in their church, but they continue to go their own way. They follow their own interest and not God's interest. You know what I'm saying is right, and you know it is true. We're all guilty of this. We probably have all done this, myself included. But God tries to start a fire in us. God tries to gain our attention. He reaches out with you to you with his word. He, he, he deals with our hearts with conviction. But we're too busy. See, we have the Martha syndrome. We're not the Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshiping God in his presence. But we're like Martha. We're too busy to sit down. We're too busy to read. We're too busy to go to church. We're too busy to read. We're too busy to, to pray. We're too busy to meditate upon the word of the Lord or to spend time in his presence. We see a bush burning but we keep walking. We see something of God, but we keep going. We just pass right on by. But listen, this is the key. When the fire starts burning, God is trying to gain our attention. He is saying, you've been wrapped up in your own affairs and your family affairs for so long, but now I'm going to start a fire. You have been so occupied and preoccupied in so many things, but now I'm about to start a burning in your heart for me. I'm going to start a fire that's going to burn in you and radiate through your life. The Spirit of God is going to blaze in your heart. That's what God is trying to do. We're not going to hear from God until we decide to turn us aside from our own way and give him our full attention. We're not going to hear from God until we spend time in his presence, until we cut out everything else for a while. I've got to get along with God. I've got to get along with Jesus. I've got to get along with the Lord. That's the attitude. The best family time you can have is bringing your family to church to worship. Teach them how to worship. Teach them how to pray. Teach them to be hungry for the word of God. Family time. Now, before I knew I was called to preach, when I got saved, I had no idea I was going to preach. I had no idea this would happen in my life. I had a full career. Abby Styers right back here is a 
wonderful, absolute amazing architect. She's, she's, she's beyond standard architect. She's, she's very good. I used to be in that field. But God changed all that. What happened to you, Pastor Mark? I don't know. I was walking along one day, and all of a sudden, I saw this bush that was burning. Yes. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and it wasn't consumed. And, and so I, I turned aside to go see what this was. And God says, I've called you to preach. I've called you. Now, I, I wrestled with that for a couple years. I, I wrestle with it sometimes today. <laughs> I, I, I've called you. I'm going to change your life, your career, your direction, everything. I want you to give me everything. I've called you for such a time as this. But before God even called me to preach, my wife and I, you know what we would do before we were married? We were, when we go on dates, we went to church. That's what we did. We went to church all the time. We went to youth uh, camps and youth meetings, and, and we went to church all the time. That was our life. That's what we did. And on the weekends, you know, we'd, we'd go to bookstores and give Christian books and all this kind of thing. You know, we just, that was our life. God was, is our life. And God, listen, he won't say anything to you turn, until he has your full attention. He waits until we put everything aside. The problem is we put God aside instead of everything else. And if it comes before God, it becomes an idol. And if we can make an idol out of anything these days, like our self-will or self-agenda can be an idol. God wants you. He wants your heart. He wants all of you. Don't offer him sick and disease sacrifices that nobody else would even have, not even governors. Give him your first. Give him your best. Give him your heart. Give him your life, your future, your plans. Give him your all. See, God told Moses, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. In the Old Testament, if someone wanted to redeem a piece of land that you owned and someone else had interest in it, you gave up your rights to that land by giving that person your right shoe or your right sandal. Then you took off your left shoe and carried it with you while you walked barefoot from that place. Moses knew what God was saying when he said, take off your sandals. He was saying, Moses, take off your shoes. Give up all your rights. Your interests are now secondary. My interests come first now, Moses. Moses, your life is consist with my life. Your will consists of my will. I place my hand upon you. You're a servant to the most high God, my Lord. I'll tell you, God is going to have a people in these last days who will turn aside from all the wickedness and the evil and the corruption and unholiness. And God is going to have a people that will turn away from good things just to spend more time with him. He's going to prepare a people who put aside careers and hobbies and sports and everything else as secondary to him. I'm not saying you quit these things. That's what I'm not telling you. Don't misunderstand. I'm saying they will lose their shine compared to the love that you have for God. Those things will be secondary. That's a job. That's a career. Whatever it might be. But those things are secondary. My my relationship with God, my relationship with the Lord, because God is going to put a blazing fire within your heart. He's beginning to kindle some right now all over the world. He's raising up a remnant that will be on fire for God and do what he calls them to do. And when you encounter God's fire, how can you think of anything else? How can you think of anything else? When God calls your name, how can you think of anything else? You're caught up with him like John was caught up in the spirit on the Lord's day. Hallelujah. Man, <laughs> praise God. I know every day is the Lord's day, but this is a sanctified time when the church gathers together. May we be caught up in the spirit. The church needs to hear from heaven again. We need to hear the voice of God. We need a fresh fire that will produce a fresh faith, that will produce something of God here and now. I don't want to just talk about it. It's time to experience it, church. It's time to call upon the Lord. Fast and pray. Fast and pray and call upon the God of heaven. Why wait? Why put it off? Why do we show no interest? Why? Why are there people that show no interest in this? God sees and God knows. May God put a fire in my soul and may he gain my attention. That's what I'm praying for for me. I need it. I want the fire. May we turn aside and may we hear God call our name as he did with Moses. Moses, Moses. Michael, Michael. Izzy. God might call you Isabel. I don't know. Brian, Brian. Faith. Faith, Tyra, Tyra, Bill, Bill, Trevor, Trevor, Jan, Jan, Alberta, Alberta, Tim, 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 Tim. You understand what I'm talking about? Matthew or Matt. You see, God, he's calling out. Praise God. Helen, Joe. 
Jackie, Rhonda, Barb, Anna, April. You see, he's calling out. Happy, or Abigail, or Jeffrey. He's calling out to you. Sue, Laura Lee. You thought you were going to get away, didn't you? Terry, Marcia, Oscar, Oscar, James. God's calling out. Maybe God is saying to us today, take off your shoes. Take off your rights. Take off your pleasures and your own interests and stand barefoot before me. I've heard the cry of bondage to sin, to drugs, alcohol, demonic powers, and I've come down to deliver. Scripture says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. A taskmaster is a tyrant who drives who drives forced laborers. And we know who this tyrant is. It is Satan who harasses and mocks. God says, I have heard the cries from heaven. The devil has afflicted you and your family long enough. Now I've come to stop it. Some of you have been tormented long enough. In your families, you have been tormented tormented long enough. It's time to look up. It's time to look to our deliverer. It's time to turn aside and see the bush that burns with fire and is depleted. God wants to gain our attention. Will you allow him to kindle a fire in your heart? Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Oh, would you come, Abby? God, kindle a fire in my heart. It begins with the leadership, Moses. <laughs> Moses. 40 years on the desert, 40 years of training, 40 years of the school of Christ. But God touched him. God has had his hand upon him. And he saw fire, and that fire burned in his bosom and his heart. Praise God. God, and I pray that you'll pray this with me. Bring the church back to having a holy fear. I, I, I'm not talking about a, an unhealthy fear, but a holy reverence and respect unto God not becoming religious, not pharisaical, nothing like that, but just having a, a, a revelation of who he is, the I am that I am. God, can we say to him today that you have gained my attention. I put everything else aside. I'm yours. I'm yours. Hallelujah. I put everything else aside. I told my wife the other day, our life consists of our service unto God and unto others. That's what it is. And I love it. It's hard, but I love it. God, it's whatever you want. I make myself available. I, I'm not telling you that God is telling you to, to quit your career, or your job, or your hobbies. I'm not telling you that. It's just those things are not what you live for. You live for God. You live for the king of glory whose eyes are like a flame of fire whose feet are like broadest, uh, polished brass whose hair is white as wool. I'm yours. God, I'm asking that you put a burning fire in my soul. Would you pray that today? Is there anybody here that would desire a burning, burning heart, a burning desire of God in your soul? I want it. I want it. I want a burning fire in my soul, Lord. I want a burning fire in my soul. I'm going to take this message. I'm going to take this today. Oh, God, put it in my heart. Maybe you're here today and say, God, I hunger for revival. I hunger for revival. A revival that will change. A revival that will transform my life. A revival that lasts longer than just the next Sunday. Oh, God, I want revival. God, I'm asking you right now to wake up the church. Help me, Lord. Body of Christ, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Wake up the church, God. Wake up the church. Wake up the church, Lord, I pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, wake us up. Wake us up, Lord God. Wake me up, Lord. God has set a time for everything. And I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want the awful presence of God the reverence of the Lord and I'm going to call on you today and I'm going to say this if you want the fire if, if you want God to wake you up if you want revival if you
you, God, want to put a holy fire in your heart. I'm going to call you up here to cry out to God. I'm going to call you up here to find a place to pray. Take this message. Take what's been said. Take it into your heart. God, change me. God, I want revival. I want the holy fire of God. I don't want just religion. I don't want flesh. I don't want man in the way. But I want God. And I want the holy reverence of God in my life. I want the holy reverence of God. I pray that you'll show up. I pray that something of heaven, something of God would show up. Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit. I pray that we would just take a little time today, Lord, and seek your face. I pray in the name of the Lord. I want the holy fire of God. I want the holy dread of God. I want it. I want it. Hallelujah, church. Do you want it? Come and, come and seek his face today. Seek his face. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. I want the holy dread of God. I, I want others. Would you come and help us to pray? I'll call our brothers and sisters to come lay hands and pray. Help us here today. I want the fire. I want the fire. If you, if you have to go, that's fine. If you have to go, that's all right. You, you, if you want to come and pray, if you want the fire, I want the fire. I want the burning fire in my heart. I want the blaze of the Spirit. I want the blaze of God. I want it. I want it. I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to be passive. I want the fire. I want the fire. I want the holy dread of God. I want the fire of the Spirit. I pray in the name of the Lord. Oh God, I cry out to a living God. I cry out to a living God. I want the fire. I want the holy dread of God. I want revival. I want the Spirit of God. I want Him to pour into me. I want to break through. I want the Spirit of the Lord. You let go, my friend. You let go and you let God do this. You cry to Him. You cry to God. You cry to God. Hallelujah. You cry to God. Jesus. Hallelujah. I want the holy dread of God. I want the holy, holy fire of God. I want it. I want Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just, just take the time and reach out to Him. Take the time. Press through. Press through. Press through. I want the holy, holy fire of God burning in my heart. I want to encounter a bush. A bush that burns. I want that burning bush in my heart. I want it in my life. I want it in my heart. I pray in the name of Jesus. I want the fire. I want the fire. I want the burning fire of God. I want, I want the awful presence of God. I want the awful presence of God. The holy dread of God to grip my heart. Grip my heart, Lord. Pray, church. God, grip my heart. Grip my heart. Grip my heart. Hallelujah. Oh God, I will not drift away. I will not become unfaithful to you. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. Touch our heart, God. Touch our heart, God. I want God. I want your blazing fire in my heart. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Just pray it, sister. I want the holy fire of God. I want the holy presence of God. I want something of God. I want heaven. I want heaven to open up. I want the burning bush. I want God. Hallelujah, sister. You got to let go and let God. You got to pour yourself out to him on that altar. Hallelujah. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. The fire, God, I want it. Bring the holy reverence back into the church. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. Oh, oh, God, my Lord, 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 my
holy presence. I want your holy presence. My Lord. us to believe. Help us to trust you. Help us to cry out to you. Help us to worship you. Oh, Father, I pray. God, I pray. Lord, I pray. In the name of the Lord. God, I praise you. Lord Jesus, we call on you, Lord God. We call on you, Lord God. Jesus. Hallelujah. God, I want the fire. God, I want the fire. I want the Holy Ghost. I want you, Lord. I pray. I worship you, Lord God. Let us hear your prayer. God touches Lord. In the name of Jesus, I want you. I want the glory. I want your presence. I want you, Lord. I want you, God. This says, I want God. There's going to be a holy grip. A holy grip. It's going to captivate my heart. It's going to captivate my heart. I want a holy grip from God. A holy grip. Don't you love the Lord? Don't you love God? Hallelujah. Just worship Him. Oh God, I pray that God would begin to captivate a people, that God would begin to touch hearts, that God would put assembly together. He'll draw the hearts of men. He'll draw the hearts of women. He'll draw the hearts of moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles. He'll draw their heart. God will begin to birth in them something that's only of heaven. And they'll be captivated by the Lord. Everything else will fade in comparison to the glory of God. And they'll be captivated by their love for him. And they'll have a holy fire in their heart. A bush that burns that God puts in there these last days. That's going to give you a power and a boldness and a courage to be a testimony unto the Lord in this, in this darkened world of Babylon today, if you will. And you'll be a testimony unto the Lord. God is going to raise up a generation. I already see a younger generation, thank God, that we see that the Lord is touching and God is raising up for His glory. Hallelujah. And that younger generation, they're going to carry the torch. They're going to take the mantle of Elijah. And they're going to proclamate the word of God. They're going to serve him. They're going to worship him. Hallelujah. You've got a remnant, though. It's a remnant. It's not very many. I see it, though. I see the remnant. And they're, they're living holy. And they're living true to God and his word. Thank God that He, the Lord is doing this. He's touching Hallelujah. I need a men, I need men in this church that'll be a backbone to your pastor. I need men in this church that have faith, 
that pray, that, that, that I know that will support and strengthen as lifting up like the hands of Moses, like Aaron and her, that we might continue to fight the battle against the Amalekites and continue to proclamate the gospel of Christ. We need men of courage, men of faith, men that want and desire the burning bush in their heart that won't just sit back but have a bush that burns within them and a holy fire and a holy grip holy dread upon them in them God, hallelujah my Lord Jesus that's what I believe the Lord is trying to say to us. I'm trying to say it to everywhere. Trying to say it to all churches, everywhere, all Christians. We know how to play church. We know how to perform. We know how to make it look good, don't we? But that is not what we're doing. That is not our heart. We are everyday people that God loves, that God has saved wants to use. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me please today? We have service tonight at 6.30. 6.30 tonight. Come, let's worship God together. Come, just believe in the Lord. Let's pray. We need miracles. We need God's help and touch. My wife is downstairs right now, but I'm going to tell you something. That, that lady's in anguish right now. She's hurting. She is hurting. Our home has been just difficult. It's, she's hurting. And uh, I got to get her down to see her mom. But it, it's difficult at the moment, but we got to get her down there. But um, if, if someone were, if she were to have to go now, I need some of you ladies to step up and step in her shoes to help to do what she would do here, okay? I need your help. We'll let you know. Now, <laughs> amen. Let's pray. God, oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you for these wonderful people. I thank you that you've saved their soul. I thank you for the cross. I, I thank you, God, for your word that we stand upon that we can understand and learn the will of God. I thank you for your presence this morning. The worship was phenomenal. The, just the, the, Lord, the ministering of the word of God. I felt your power and your anointing, and I felt your presence. I believe that there's something you're trying to speak to the church today. God, I pray this has to be something of you. We can't make this up, but I pray that there be a holy reverence of God that would come back into the hearts of your people. I pray, God, that there be a, a holy dread that would come back into the church. That we would not look at you as just a daddy or a good buddy, but understand that you're Lord, that you're God Almighty, that you're holy. Oh, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord that we would see you once again as Isaiah saw you, high and lifted up as John the Apostle saw you, and he fell as a dead man, as Daniel saw you, Lord God. I pray that we would see you in the Spirit. And I pray, God, that the holy reverence and the holy fear and the holy dread of God would grip our hearts once again. And I pray that your people, us right here, it, let it begin right here. Let the bush begin to burn right here in our hearts, God. I want you. God, I want you to have all of me. Here we are, God. We give ourselves to you. Now, God, help us to live this life for you. It's a surrendered life, a sold-out life. But, God, it's a great life. It's a wonderful life. It's a glorious life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Your blessing, your presence, your anointing upon your people. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come on. Shake hands. Hug some necks. Shake hands. Hug some necks.